Um, welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Johns Hopkins nurse surgeon Nicholas Theodore will speak about the latest surgical treatments for tethered spinal cord. Before we begin, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. First, please note that this program is being recorded. The first 30 minutes of our webinar will include an informative presentation by Dr. Theodore. Uh, the last 30 minutes will be dedicated to a live Q&A session. We will do our best to answer all the questions we receive during this time. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so if you do not want to have your name attached to your question, please check send anonymously. Alternatively, you can email us questions at hopkinsseminars at ghmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. Look for a pop-up window to appear so that you can do this. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Theodore to begin our presentation. Thanks, uh, Morag, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, my name is Dr. Nicholas Theodore. I'm a professor of neurosurgery and orthopedics and biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins. And really throughout my career, I've had a lifelong interest in the treatment of tethered spinal cord. And I wanted to take you through a little bit of the history and treatment options available for patients with this disorder, and also some of the research uh, that we're doing. And then also let you uh, hear from a patient uh, who's had surgery for this and then uh, answer any questions that you might have. So the first question is, and pe people are always asking, you know, what is tethered spinal cord? And the reality is that it is a, a, an embryologic problem where the spinal cord doesn't ascend, doesn't go up to where it needs to go, and it ends up being stretched. And oftentimes that has to do with having a small fatty tumor at the end, we talk about children who are born with a lipomyelomeningocele or myelomeningocele will have tethered cord. But the bottom line is the spinal cord doesn't like to be stretched. And when it's stretched, bad things happen. So the tethered cords, the symptoms of tethered cord really are sort of all over the place from a neurologic perspective. And when you start pu pulling on anything, whether it's a nerve or the spinal cord, the neurologic symptoms occur, and those can become very serious. And they can become very debilitating for the patient. So when we talk about the causes, and one of the causes, obviously, is having some fat at the bottom of the spinal cord, which, like a piece of chewing gum, sticks to the spinal cord at the bottom of the spinal canal, causing tension. And then there are things that, you know, where people are born with, whether it's a lipo, meaning fat, lipomyelomeningocele or myelomeningocele. Then there's some rare things, split cord malformation, and then sometimes tethering from scar tissue. So how do patients present? Well, interestingly, all over the place. There really isn't a textbook example of, of these patients because the disease process is very variable. Some patients who have a lipoma or lipomyelomeningocele have very few symptoms. Others are debilitated by their symptoms. And those symptoms can include pain in the lower back, pain in the legs, pain in the groin region, they can lose sensory function, in other words, their ability to feel their legs and feel where they are in space, have weakness, actual motor weakness, problems walking. Then there are also issues with bladder and bowel incontinence and, and sexual function. So it can really affect almost every sphere of function, uh, you know, in a patient from the waist down. In childhood, you know, we talk about this, a lot of these patients will be born with a problem, but later in life, not have issues, which is great. Uh, when pay, when children are born, we'll look for things like club foot. We'll look for this telltale patch in the lower back of hair that some children will have that, that is a sign that there might be something happening underneath the skin uh, with the, the spinal cord. And our pediatricians are very uh, skilled at looking for that. And then the radiologic pictures of what we see. You know, and again, in adults, it's interesting if you have a tethered spinal cord and know that that you have one, you couldn't do fine until something as trivial as a slip in a fall or some sort of trauma, which sets off a cascade of neurologic issues. And why does this happen? Well, it happens because the spinal cord likes to have play in it. It likes to be able to move. So when we move our head up and down, the spinal cord is is actually being stretched. 
And if it's tethered at the bottom, if it's the end point is fixed at the bottom, moving your head and stretching and just natural movements of the body can cause problems. So we've looked at this in the neck and it's quite fascinating. When you uh, bend your head backwards and put your look up at the ceiling, the spinal cord is relaxed. And when you bend your head forward, it's stretched. And this is some beautiful work that was done in the 1960s. But on the left, what you see are those fibers of the spinal cord stretched. Everything's nice and straight and taut. That's when the neck is in flexion with the head down. So that's just the positioning of your neck can change the stretch on the spinal cord. And then when you extend your neck and put it into a neutral position, see how wavy the fibers become? That just shows you that, that there's dynamic movement in the spinal cord. This is what we want. This is what God intended when we were designed. The issue is that at the end of the day, if the spinal cord is tethered at the bottom, uh, then that just bending the neck or natural movement can cause a problem. So when somebody has a tethered spinal cord, this is what we do. This is the sort of the standard procedure that has been around for, you know, 60, 70 years, which is what we call the tethering operation. We open up and what you see that bright yellow and, you know, uh, is fat at the end of the spinal cord. And what we're doing is sort of looking around we stimulate the nerves and we take those scar tissue down trying to detether to take away the scar tissue that's on the spinal cord. But interestingly enough, as we do this and have done hundreds of these operations, the spinal cord's still stuck at the bottom. We can never actually make the spinal cord unstuck. And you know, the, traditionally when you look at how patients do after the, the detethering operation, they have an operation, they will get better for a period of time. Then they start getting worse. We do another operation. They may get a little bit better. Then they start getting worse. And I think part of the problem is that we never really address the root cause of the problem, which is that even though we take those adhesions away at the bottom of the spinal cord, the spinal cord is still under stretch. And that's why most patients, we're, we don't do one operation or one detethering. Many of these patients and most every patient that I've operated on has had multiple operations. So the question becomes, what else can we do? Is there some other way to treat this problem? Is there another opportunity to take the stretch away from the spinal cord? And the answer is yes. And if the, the, the answer I think is something that we call shortening. And this was an operation devised in Japan a number of years ago uh, by Dr. Kokobun, where he would take out a vertebral body. And what you see in this, this animation is a vertebral body being removed and then the spinal column being shortened. So what we actually do is take out, and usually it's at the level of T12 or L1, but take out a vertebral body and then slowly and carefully uh, shrink the patient as you will, would to be able to take that tension off. So if you think about tethered spinal cord, the analogy would be, a stack of building blocks with a rubber band stretched around all 12 building blocks. Nothing that we're gonna do at the bottom is gonna cause that tension to go away, but by taking one of the building blocks out and shortening the entire system, we can actually free that tension up. This is from one of Coco Bun's original articles of what he thought about how to do this. The nice thing about this operation, the shortening operation, is that we don't actually have to open the dura we don't actually cut and manipulate uh, you know, scar tissue around the nerves. The, the likelihood of getting a spinal fluid leak is significantly less. And I think that ultimately it really provides the ultimate solution for the problem, which is stretch. The disadvantages of the shorting operation is it's a bigger operation and from a spine stability standpoint, and that there's some risk of needing additional surgery just from the hardware that we put in. These are some illustrations that were done by Ian Suk, who's our, one of our illustrators here at Johns Hopkins, showing taking out most of the vertebral body of T12, looking to shorten the vertebral column by between 22 and 26 millimeters. That's about an inch. So again, taking away an inch of bone to be able to shorten that, and we'll show you what that looks like at the end. But the whole thought process is that in patients in whom this is indicated, well, instead of going at the bottom and trying to take care of that scar tissue, which never really makes the spinal cord ascend, take that pressure away by taking out the vertebral body. And, and as you do that, we put some screws in, 
pedicle screws in above and below, and then ultimately very carefully slowly collapse the that that uh, that gap so that the spinal cord doesn't become stretched. So quick warning here, this is some surgical video from a number of years ago, but we make a large incision, we'll put screws in, and then ultimately what we do is once all the screws are in and it's safe, and this is this requires at least two surgeons to do this operation, uh, we ultimately end up putting in a tower and then closing that gap. And as you close the gap immediately, the tension on the spinal cord is relieved. And we'll show you some pictures of what's that, what that looks like. So a number of years ago, I started a prospective trial. I wanted to see how these patients did. We published in that a couple of years ago, a series of about 20 patients uh, and who we followed for the long term. We've now done this operation in over 70 patients with, with really excellent results. And what did we find? Well, we're always trying to figure out obviously of what we do, uh, how patients do. So when we look at things that these patients suffer from, it's severe back and leg pain. I'm talking about excruciating pain. When you look at the detethering operation, it talks about you know 56 to 100% get better. But as I told you before, that 100% is probably a little bit misleading because it doesn't appear to bear out over time. In our series for long-term follow-up, we have about an 88% improvement in pain. Urinary incontinence and, and incontinence of bowel, that is a tricky thing, and that is a very sensitive part of the nervous system, and oftentimes those patients uh, will get better, but it's not it's not the most common thing. So about 50% of patients, which I think is great, uh, got better. When you look at compared to tethering, again, 14 to 75%, but what I will tell you is our follow-up was much longer uh, than in most of those series. Motor deficits, we had about an 80% improvement um, in, in patients uh, who are getting weakness of the legs. So again, when you look at the sum total of these problems, you know, back and leg pain, and we look at sensory abnormalities, about 80% get better. So our in our series of shortening, we really, you know, in a very robust way showed improvement in these patients. And what we did was follow them for a number of years. This isn't a an operation in which we've have, I've ever had to go back and redo because once the the tensions off the spinal cord, I think there's nothing else that needs to be done. So no more detethering operations. So what does it look like? You know, this is an MRI scan that you're looking at, and what you see in the left panel is that before surgery, the spinal cord is straight, it's stretched, it sort of dives into the scar tissue, and this is a spinal cord that's not happy. The spinal cord doesn't like to be stretched. When we, this is the, the post-operative patient, you see the shadows of the screws here, but you see, look at, it's so, it's wavy. So you see the actual tension has been released. And we measured in the cross section, we measured the diameter. So imagine the spinal cord like a piece of licorice. You take a piece of licorice, you pull on it, it becomes thin and narrow. You take that tension off and it, res it resumes uh, 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 you know, to, a, to its normal size. And that's what's happening we've seen in the spinal cord. We've been able to demonstrate this looking at MRI scans. So we've shown that the, the actual pictures look better. But I think there's more to the story than just those pictures, although I think that is, to me, was convincing enough for me. We're now looking at uh, other things, and I'll talk to you about some of the research we're doing. But certainly on the imaging studies, we've shown that uh, the tension can be relieved. We've demonstrated that radiographically. We also know that uh, the operation is very safe and effective. Mm -hmm. This is some of the research we're doing now on something called elastography. I'm going to play this quick video for you. So we've had, we've been very closely involved in the in research regarding ultrasound, and it's fascinating because I can take an ultrasound probe now in surgery and make a measurement on how stretched the spinal cord is. So, for example, using the licorice analogy, I can get a picture of the piece of licorice, 
and tell you whether it's stretched or not stretched. And we're doing that with the spinal cord in surgery. And this is some of our early data. But what you see here in the top on the, the left-hand column, this is before shortening. And what you see is that you can see the spinal cord is very stretched at the top, but the shear wave propagation shows a spinal cord that's being stretched. In the middle, as we shorten, you can see there's a little bit of a wave in the spinal cord here. And what we see with the shear wave is that the tension has decreased. And then as we fully shorten the patient, close that gap completely, what we see is a beautiful uh, curvature of the spinal cord, uh, uh, not under tension at all. And the shear wave bears that out. When we look at it statistically in our patients now, we've got several patients uh, that we've done this on. We are able to demonstrate very convincingly utilizing ultrasound that the patient has uh, has been shortened correctly. So I, I want to I want to share with you at this point. We're very uh, blessed to have on the call Katura, who is a patient, and, and Katura had undergone five previous detethering operations before I met her. Was in a tremendous amount of pain was having issues with, with bladder weakness. It was, it was really having difficulty focusing uh, in school. And I think we may have an issue with uh, the volume, which is okay, because we've got the benefit of having uh, Katura here to talk to about her story in a minute. But this is just showing you, again, the spinal cord prior to surgery. And what you see is stretched, anchored at the bottom here with scar tissue. And you know, having had five different operations. Uh, just so you understand, this is a normal spinal cord. And the end of the spinal cord right here is called the conus, that little triangular tip. And it, usually the spinal cord ends at L1. In patients who have a tethered cord, you see the spinal cord ends all the way down at the bottom. So it is physically being stretched. If we can't hear the video, we're, again, we'll, we'll skip that. But but the reality is I want to have Katura talk about her, her story here and and. As we look at the surgery, you know, in, in these patients, the anatomy can be very difficult to, to navigate. So we put our screws through this corridor here called the pedicle. Look how tiny that is. And again, the nice thing is in our ability to utilize technology, what we call image guidance, and actually a robot to help us put the pedicle screws in because there's no way by hand to be able to do this uh, safely. And the reality is that we use all the advanced technology, whether it's ultrasound, image guidance, robotics, monitoring, to do this operation as safely as possible. Every operation has an inherent risk to it, but we want to make that risk as small as possible for our patients. This is sort of what things look like after. And again, this is a picture of the robot that's used. So just to show you, again, uh, uh the the before and after again you see on the on the top here the spinal cord stretched it's thinned out as we shorten the vertebral column it becomes a little bit more normal on the left what you're seeing is the spinal cord before shorting and i want to just show you this right here there's the spinal cord and you see it's moving and all those little things that are beating those are that's blood flow going to the spinal cord look after the shortening what we see that spinal cord is happy it's basically moving in the spinal canal like it should but again, using the licorice analogy, you pull on the licorice, it's not going to bounce up and down like that. But after the shortening, you see how it's uh, how it's moving much better. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna since the, the sound's not coming through, it's worth watching the pictures of Couture boxing after, running after, skydiving, I don't even wanna talk about that. Um, so, this is just an overview, I think, of a of a problem that really has been vexing for us as physicians and surgeons. The problem really requires, you know, significant amount of expertise. The patients I know from taking care of hundreds of patients are suffering with this problem. And I think the take-home message is that there is hope. And what I'd like to do is to again introduce Katura and how, let her talk a little bit about her story and you know what her experience was with this operation and, and she's a bit of a trailblazer uh, and then we can answer questions after that. Katuro, good to see you again as always. Thank you for the opportunity. 
Um, so yes, as Dr. Theodore mentioned, my name is Katora, and I'm going to share a little bit of what it was like before the procedure that Dr. Theodore performed. Um, growing up in my very young years, especially, I wanted to be active in sports, but due to um, the tethering, I faced a lot of challenges and obstacles with that. I would fall a lot. I would not be able to play to my full potential. I ended up getting benched, was barely able to participate, let alone in just sports, but a lot of just normal day activities. I found myself on the couch most of the time. I had a lot of the symptoms that Dr. Theodore mentioned, such as um, loss of bladder control, which would have made it difficult for me to really do much in public with that concern on my mind. Um, when I had opportunities to teach in school that I actually had to cut down hours because I could barely make it through the day just standing alone in the classroom. So all of these untethering surgeries eventually, like they gave me temporary relief, but they were not giving me long-term results. And it got to a point where we were questioning, you know, how far do we go with this? We've had five of these untethering surgeries and we keep finding ourselves here again and again. And I began to question what my future would even look like. Would I be able to fulfill my dreams? Would I be able to ever have a family of my own or anything? And thankfully that's when Dr. Theodore came into the picture and he presented me with this procedure that would potentially give me the life that I'd always dreamed of. So with much confidence in him and many prayers, we went into this and I came out way better on the other side. I woke up feeling this almost space in my back. Um, I had always described the pain as like a pulling and tight feeling in my back that was just burning. It just hurt so, so bad. And the minute I woke up, I just felt this incredible release I had never experienced in my life. And I just knew right away that I had made the best decision by trusting Dr. Theodore with this. And I, um, I'm just so grateful because now I actually have my own family. I have two beautiful children who keep me busy. Um, and I have an incredible husband as well. I am able to do things uh, such I started some small businesses, which I never thought I'd be able to do because of being on my feet. I've um, gotten back into boxing again and just uh, working out regularly, running and I'm very appreciative of this, and I um, would definitely recommend it to anybody who is looking for this sort of option for their future. And I've had many people come to me uh, who had said that this was an option for them and asked if it was worth it. And every single time I say absolutely 100%. Tell us about the the hospital stay, the pain after surgery, Katura. Everybody's Everybody's different, but that's just something to talk about, if you would, for a second. Sure. A lot of people ask me actually what the recovery time is like. And of course, that's going to be different for every person. But something that Dr. Theodore and I agreed on and discussed was that staying active was the best thing. Um, so my hospital stay, I will say, you know, surgery is painful no matter what. So I can't say I woke up feeling like I was going to go do 10 jumping jacks. But I certainly was able to get up and walk uh, pretty soon after within a couple of days. And I was just so energized to be feeling the best I ever had in my life that I was like walking several laps around the hallway within a couple of days, just because that's how good I felt. Um, and then I would say for getting back to what felt like a new normal for me took about a month. Um, and that was just walking a lot. I, I walked about a mile every day, eventually up to three miles by month two, I was able to start kind of jogging again. And by month three, I was back at college running, boxing, um, so I would say definitely a little bit of a slow recovery, but I'd say pretty quick in general. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, these are big operations. I mean, and, and you had been through five detethering operations. I think what most, every single patient, and I think you were in the, on that list said, when I asked them after, would you rather have another detethering operation or a shorting operation? And it's in hindsight always, but uh, you know, your thoughts just comparing the two procedures. The two procedures, uh, I would say with the untethering, I had, so I had five of them, four of which I remember. Um, the 
amount of time that I felt relief from the surgery was maybe six months. And then I would say definitely within a year after having the untethering surgery, I would start to notice symptoms again. And it was very discouraging. Um, sometimes the symptoms came on very quickly. It was kind of out of nowhere. Like all of a sudden, all these symptoms just started happening. I uh, was falling and having pain in my feet and my legs. Sometimes it was more gradual. But I would say I had at least six months of feeling, quote, normal with the untethering surgeries versus the spinal shortening. I have never had that pulling in tight feeling that I've described previously. Like I've never had that again since the spinal shortening. Um, I can't say, yeah, I, I, I've truly, truly felt the best I've ever felt in my life since having the spinal shortening. Yeah, I think you, you bring up a good point. And, and I think the other thing for everybody listening to this to understand is that every patient is different and every patient presents at a different standpoint. And there's, there isn't a, you know, a one size fits all a, a presentation for this. So I've said patients who, you know, who are literally wheelchair bound over the course of, you know, six months prior to surgery. And then those who are actually, you know, doing fairly well. And again, in my mind, the, if you're having symptoms and they're getting worse, it's at least worth the conversation. Um, and I will be very honest and I am with all my patients. Sometimes it's not the right time to think about it. Sometimes the symptoms are bad enough to think about it because we do have to balance the fact that it is an operation and it's not a small operation. It's a big operation. And, you know, timing that for each patient is difficult. So we've got some questions. Um, the first question says, how can a patient go about finding someone who does spinal shortening? Well, you found them. I'm right here. Um but, the, you know, it says a lot of folks are limited in their states when they ask a neurosurgeon they don't perform the procedure. So I, I will tell you that I think one of the issues is that, to that point, this is something that needs to be done really at a specialized center. It should be done by somebody who has some experience in this as well. Um, there are a few places in the country uh, where uh, surgeons are starting to do this and are getting experience. And we were really blessed here at Hopkins. I have an amazing team that I work with on a daily basis to take care of these patients. I think it's worth the conversation, no matter where you live, uh, certainly can contact us, get some imaging sent in. We can do a telemedicine or get some information from you and have an understanding. Sometimes it's, it's if it's possible, it's definitely worth traveling, um, you know, for surgery, especially for something that is very specialized like this. Um, the next question, uh, comes up, how much shorter do you get after surgery? I'm going to let Couture answer that. Um, yeah, I actually had marked before and after the surgery just to see, and Dr. Silver did mention the inch. I feel like, um, for me, maybe a little bit more, even because <laughs> buying jeans now is a little bit complicated. My waist is definitely shorter but it's definitely not a hindrance in any way. <laughs> <laughs> so we aim, we aim uh, about 22 to 26 millimeters. And again, that's right around the, uh, the inch standpoint. Um, again, it's not that anybody's too tall before the operation, but, but it's that uh, our ability to sh take that tension off the spinal cord requires us to, to make you a little bit shorter. So um Next question is, how many patients have scoliosis due to tethered cord, and can this procedure work on them? That's a great question. Um, it becomes more complicated uh, in patients who have especially a significant scoliosis. Uh, we've operated on patients like this before. Um, it really depends on where they are in the course of their disease. It depends on whether or not the scoliosis has been treated before, et cetera. Uh, that would be a conversation to have. Uh, easily uh, after submitting some imaging and the history so that we can sort of help figure out exactly where that lies. But that is a that is a definitely a more complicated group of patients uh, than the patients that don't have scoliosis. So I, the next question I think is really probably one of the, you know, something that's very important. And the question is, is this a surgery of last resort after multiple untethering surgeries or should it be considered sooner? So let me let me address that. When I first started doing this, I offered every patient a regular detethering operation. And what I said was, I'm trying this other procedure out, which I believe, based on my experiments in the lab, 
and reading that is beneficial, but I can't say that for sure. I have now come to the to the realization that this should be considered early. Somebody, every single patient in our series of 70 patients has had at least one detethering operation, and the end, what I'll call the index operation. But and unlike Keturah, who went through five, we're now on the second operation. At least it's, I think it's a conversation to have. Again, it may not be the solution for everybody, but we're learning a lot and it's a conversation that should be had. So I do not think it's a surgery of last resort. Quite the contrary, I would uh, I would consider having it earlier uh, in, you know, in life and earlier before symptoms get too bad. Because again, if it's the, if it ends up being the final operation, which I think it is for the treatment of this problem, why not get that done sooner rather than later? Uh, did you, did you want to comment on that, Troy? Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Definitely the sooner, the better, in my opinion, because I have so much more that I can do now because of the surgery. Had I waited, symptoms could have definitely gotten worse, but also I would have missed out on so much in life just in general. So, you know, again, that's a, it's something I think I'm coming to the realization that it's going to be at some point will be the first line therapy for this in, in many cases. Um, but we're in, you know, in neurosurgery and in pediatric neurosurgery, we're slow to adopt things. So a lot of people, you know, there's still questions. We've published our series. There have been other large series down published. The more we get, the more data we get, especially on how patients do, the more convinced I am. But I'm, but right now I'm convinced. The next question is, uh, have you worked on older patients? So I guess the first question is, what's old? Uh, I, I know I've done, uh, operated on a patient uh, in her 70s uh, that was actually doing quite well, but had significant deterioration after an injury. It all depends. So the answer is, in some cases, I mean, really age doesn't make a difference. The presentation makes a difference. The pathology makes a difference. And certainly age would only make a difference if for whatever reason, the patient was you know, really not well enough to tolerate a big surgery. So, but age really shouldn't be an issue. I, my feeling is, and what I'm seeing now are younger patients, because I think this is, you know, parents on the internet are understanding that uh, there's an opportunity to uh, potentially treat this without having to go through multiple procedures. So the next question is, can this technique be used on a cord that is tethered up in the cervical and thoracic region? So the answer is, this is not for that. So this really is for the tethering at the bottom. When somebody talks about being tethered in the cervical or thoracic region, something usually something else is going on. We, I do surgery for that. I do surgery for all types of spinal cord problems. This would be a conversation to have via consultation to understand what the problem is. But this this isn't the same issue. And the reason for that is that in the cervical and thoracic spine, there are little ligaments that sort of hold the spinal cord in place. Those ligaments stop at T12. Below that level is the mobile segment of the spine and spinal cord. That's why this works. So it doesn't work by taking a bone out of the neck and shortening somebody. We would not do that because that's not the same problem. But there are different types of tethering. And unfortunately, the word tethering in the medical literature is unfortunate because it has multiple different meanings. So it's a very difficult, uh, when we talk about tethering, it's very difficult to have the proper conversation without knowing all the facts. So more than happy to review cases like that. So the next question is, you know, how long does the surgery take and are there, are few, are there any future consequences to consider? The surgery itself takes about between four hours and six hours. And, you know, it is a, it's a big operation. We, and, you know, oftentimes, not oftentimes, we'll, sometimes we'll need a blood transfusion if we do lose blood, but most of the times it's very safe. Obviously we've seen that it's very effective, but it is a big operation in the hospital for probably four or five days after surgery. And then, you know, taking time to recover. The better you are going into the procedure, the better you are on the way out. So in other words, a younger, healthier person, um, you know, has an easier time recovering from surgery. Uh, Couture is a perfect example for that. As we get older, it takes longer to heal. If we're very debilitated, it can take longer as well. So those are all considerations. As far as the future considerations go, 
yeah, problems can occur. We put hardware in, we can have issues with failure of a hardware. We have had issues with a screw break. We've had issues, things like things that can happen. The, the construct is usually safe. Long-term effects we'll know in 20 years, but I'm not really worried outside of this because we've had large experience infusing patients in the spine with long-term follow-up. But we do, we'll, we you know, always be available for our patients, you know, throughout the course of their life should something change. The next question is, what if I am already fused? So that would depend on exactly what was fused. And the, the reality is that's, again, there's an opportunity to look at what's happened in your life, what's been done. We've, I've, I've seen a patient who actually had a fusion where they distracted in the lumbar spine and actually the patient got much worse after the surgery uh, had a tethered cord, which wasn't really recognized or wasn't felt to be a problem. So those are those are more complicated issues, uh, but certainly again worth uh, we're sending your information in for us to review, and we can make a decision or, or see if we can help you in that way. So the next question is, you know, for children born with life, with myelomeningocele,s do tethering perform during correcting anomaly itself, or may they need further tetherings or shortening? So when a child is born with a, a myelomeningocele or lipomyelomeningocele, the reality is that we, at, at, if there's an operation that's done at birth to put the nervous tissue back inside the body and to correct that problem, um, that is not the end of the story. So in many cases, you know, this is a problem that, you know, recurs. And, and what I mean by recurs is symptomatically the patient will, will become worse. That's why the, you know people do repeat to tethering operations, which is why Katura had multiple operations. She did well for a period of time, then started getting worse, having pain and weakness, et cetera. So the reality is that the initial operation obviously is just the starting point as it is in life. It doesn't, you know, the, the, these are, are patients that oftentimes will require at least a second operation. From my standpoint, I'm getting to the point where that second operation, if it's the correct time in the patient's life, may be the shortening operation. And those are that's where we're sort of evolving to at this point, although we're continuing to collect data uh, going forward and have a better answer for that as time goes on. But the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, oftentimes these patients require, uh, everyone requires at least one and, you know, most of the times at least two or if not more surgeries. Um, and, but, but I do think that the, the shortening is probably the, the, going to be the ultimate for this disease. In other words, we wouldn't need to do anything else from a, from a nervous system standpoint. So the next question is, do internal organs get squished after the surgery because you get shorter? Uh, no, that doesn't happen. So as we shorten the spinal column, the rest of the abdomen and body, you know, there's nothing, there are no untoward effects to that. We don't, there's no uh, squishing of the organs at all. Katura, you didn't feel like your spleen was getting squished or anything, did you? No. No, yeah, no. That's not a good question, but not a problem. Um, next question is to remove the anterior spinal column. Are you doing an anterior as well as a posterior approach? That's a very good question. Everything is done with one incision from behind. So we can actually, we work around the spinal cord to remove that vertebral body utilizing image guidance and very sophisticated drills and other tools to be able to remove that. Once the screws are in place, we have a temporary rod in place to hold the patient still because once the body is removed, really it becomes two different people. And then, the, then we do the shortening, but um, it's just through one operation. So it's not an anterior and a posterior approach. It's just one operation. Next question is, does the procedure work for patients that have spina bifida, occulta, split cord and searing in addition to tethered cord? Another great question. So split cord malformation is, is you know, even more rare than, than uh, lipomyelomeningocele. That's, that's a special case. And, and because the, the, what happens in that case is the spinal cord actually has a hole in it and a piece of bone or other tissue is in the middle of the spinal cord, that needs to be addressed prior to considering any shorting operation. So that is a very special uh, patient. Again, all of my patients are special. The reality is that that's something that uh, we would have to look at. So does the, it, the procedure definitely would work, but it may require 
another procedure before to either release the septum in the split cord uh, or to do something to address some other issue. So great question. And this is what, you know, this is what I said from the very beginning was this is a very, you know, broad range of presentation in these patients. So the fact of the matter is that every single patient is special and different in their own way. And again, this requires sort of a holistic approach and experience matters, right? Going to somebody who takes care of this on a daily basis, being able to put that entire picture together for you is what is really what matters. Um, the next question is, can this be performed on a person with a spinal fusion from T4 to L5 due to scoliosis with three untetherings? So again, the, you know, very specific case with a large, you know, uh, spinal fusion, the reality is definitely can be done. We're going to be a, a lot more challenging uh, than a virgin operation in that area. Uh, uh, probably worth a discussion uh, in submitting imaging for review because this is something that is, you know, there's definitely a possibility. Um, but again, we'd have to look at the pictures and see exactly what's been done. Um Next question is, will the surgery improve symptoms if the nerves are adhesed, the scar tissue at the bottom, and if the phylum terminology is not directly involved? So the answer is yes, because again, all those nerves by definition are encased in fat or scar, and especially if the patient has already had a surgery, but that's the problem. That's all at the very bottom. And because we cannot fix the problem from the bottom, which is why this whole uh, idea of shorting works, because again, you're indirectly taking the stretch out without having to go through that scar tissue. The patients who've had multiple detethering operations, many of them will end up with a spinal fluid leak, spinal headaches, other issues. And it's, that's what becomes very debilitating in recovery. Every single patient that I've operated on that's had, a that's had a shorting operation has said to me that they would rather have that than a repeat detethering operation for, for many reasons. Um. Is the surgery covered by major commercial insurance companies? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, really have not had any issues. Uh, the insurance companies, you know, is as problematic as they can be at times. Uh, obviously, they, they serve a purpose in, 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 you know, providing coverage for us, but it's usually a discussion. I have talked to insurance companies about this before. I have never had a case where insurance has not uh, approved the surgery. So that's, that's, that's actually good news. So how would one go about sending MRI scans and getting a consultation? The phone number that's on the screen right now, 410-955-4424, uh, is our consultation line. Uh, you can go on that, uh, that line, call that number, tell them that you saw the webinar, tell them that you uh, want to make an appointment with me or send imaging in, and they'll give you instructions on how to do that. You know, it can take a week or two to, to review everything because we do have a high volume of patients coming through, but we'll look at the imaging and get word back to you and figure out uh, what next steps are for this. So what are the advantages of the procedure versus detethering and the risks of the procedure and the time frame for surgery and recovery? Okay, so I, re I reviewed that. One of the slides had advantages. Again, we're not opening the spinal sac. We're not directly cutting scar tissue around the spinal cord. We're not manipulating the spinal cord directly. So that's the major advantage. And in a more profound and robust way, we're taking the tension off the spinal cord. So for when you think about what it is that we're trying to do, we do a much, much better job with the shorting operation than we do with the standard to tethering operation. You know, the risks of both surgeries, anytime we do any sort of surgery, the risks are anything you can think of, death, coma, paralysis, Complications can occur. This is a very safe operation when done in the proper setting. Uh, you know, again, with two surgeons and uh, you know a team that has done this on a, on a daily basis, that's your best bet as a patient. Um, we pray every day we don't have complications, but we also understand that they can occur. Um, recovery time frame again, four or five days in the hospital, and then you know back to everything probably three months when, when, until we're sort of back to the new, you know, new, new baseline without much issue. You know, when you say shortening is done slowly, yes, right. Intraoperatively, that's correct. So uh, maybe I misspoke, but 
you go in five foot five, you come out at five foot four. The reality is that that happens in surgery. So it's not, when I say slowly, we do it very carefully and under control fashion in surgery over the course of a few uh, minutes, but it's all done. That's all done in surgery. Um, so the, the next question is my tether is higher up at around L12, wondering if it's possible. Again, it all depends on what the anatomy looks like and what the history is. So these are all great questions. And, and a lot of the questions which are personalized, it would be impossible for me to answer, you know, without seeing the images, understanding what surgeries you've had and potentially speaking with you. So uh, I urge you to send in, uh, send in your information and have your imaging up, uh, uploaded. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, this is a procedure which uh, we now have excellent history with, been doing it now for over 10 years. We've got, you know, multiple patients, including, uh, I'm going to say my favorite patient, but I'm not going to say that, but Katura, one of my favorite patients. Um, and I appreciate her sharing her story with, with us. I think ultimately there's hope. And I think we're really getting much more sophisticated with ultrasound and everything, how we evaluate these patients and how we treat them. So I think the future is bright. I think there is hope for this. Uh, when I remember starting medical school and it was very nihilistic, we, we would say there really isn't much to do. These patients are miserable their whole life, but I know that not to be the case. Uh, and there is hope. Like everything else in life, timing is everything. And I think it's something to consider earlier rather than later. So we've got the contact information up for you. If you have any questions or would like to submit everything, I, I sincerely uh, thank Katura for taking time away from her two beautiful children to join us today. And I thank everybody for uh, for being on and look forward to, to talking with people as time goes on. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much for, for attending.